Hey there, everyone. Uh, so let's go ahead and finish up chapter 14 here. So if you remember before we went on spring break, we didn't quite finish uh, our discussion on vision. In fact, I don't think we ever really got started on it. Uh, so if chapter 14 is mostly about uh, somatic sensory physiology, so far we've covered four out of the five senses, right? So we've covered uh, the somatosensory stuff, so touch, temperature, pain, vibration, things of that nature. We've covered uh, taste and smell, and we've covered hearing and equilibrium. So the last thing for us to discuss here is going to be vision. Uh, so vision is another one of the special senses, meaning that we can only uh, detect visual stimuli in very particular places. Namely, we're talking about the eyes. Uh, so here you can actually see a diagram of the eye. It's not the most simple uh, structure in the human body to look at. Uh, so one thing we can do right away to make our job easier is to uh, basically bisect it in half right down the middle there. So we can split it up into an anterior segment on this side and then a posterior segment on this side. Uh, so what we're going to accomplish by splitting it up that way is we can kind of divide up the responsibilities in terms of what we're going to see is that most of what the anterior segment is going to do is take the incoming light that is coming through the pupil, treat it and refract it in such a way such that by the time it strikes the posterior segment of the eye, which is where the retina and all of the sensory receptors are going to be located, that light should be focused and ready to go so that we should be able to transmit information about a clear and crisp image through the optic nerve, which you can see right here, to the brain, to the thalamus, and then eventually to uh, the visual processing center in the occipital lobe. Yeah, so you can kind of see this summed up here. The whole purpose of the anterior segment uh, is that light comes in through the pupil, which is basically just kind of a hollow region uh, in the center of the iris. Uh, different structures in the anterior segment, such as the cornea and uh, different fluids and the lens, are going to refract that light, and we'll talk about what exactly that means, so that by the time the light strikes the retina in the posterior segment, every, all that light is going to be focused and in phase, so that hopefully we should see something uh, in a clear and crisp way. Uh, so the iris, which we're going to discuss a little bit more in chapter 15 here in a, in a, a couple of lectures. Uh, the iris is basically, it's kind of hard to see here, but the iris is kind of what forms kind of like a diaphragm around the pupil. Uh, so the iris is kind of that colored portion of the eye. Uh, basically, it is composed of two different types of smooth muscle, and these two types of smooth muscle... Uh, can open up and close down the pupil. It kind of acts like the diaphragm in a camera. Uh, the cornea, which you can see right here, the cornea is kind of this outermost coating of epithelial cells that uh, is actually completely transparent, which is a good thing because it allows light to completely pass through. And it's also going to protect the interior part of the eye from bacteria and all the creepy crawly things that we don't want to get in there because uh, it turns out that the interior part of the eye is not benefiting from your body's immune system. There are There is no immune presence in there, so we definitely want to keep the bacteria out. Okay, so if we're going to start with the anterior part of the eye, the first thing that we need to address is the refraction of light. So the refraction of light refers to the bending or redirection of light as it passes from one medium into another. Now, what we mean by a medium is basically just some homogenous mixture of things, right? So the air that's all around us, that is a medium. Water is a medium. So if you've ever gone swimming before, you may notice that if it's sunny out, if you look down into a surface of water, you can see uh, the shapes of things are a little bit distorted. And we owe that to light passing from the air into the water, bending and causing your perception of an object to change as it goes from the air into the water. So if you ever, if you see like a stick sticking down into the water, 
the stick may appear to be straight down and then it appears to kind of bend once it goes into the water. So that's all due to the refraction of light. So light is going to bend anytime it passes from one medium to another if those two media have different refractive indices or refractive indexes. So in terms of the physics behind this, we're not going to really get into the physics. Uh, this is all described by something called Snell's Law. So what Snell's Law allows us to do is if we know the refractive index of the two media, so in this picture here, this would be one medium right here. We can say it's the air. This would be our second medium down here. We'll say it's water. If we know the refractive index of air, which is always going to be arbitrarily set at 1.00, and we know the refractive index of water, which is going to be something a little bit greater than one, uh, we should be able to predict the angle of change of that light as it refracts in if we know this angle right here. So it's basically just an algebraic equation with four variables and we should know three of the four variables and we can calculate the fourth. So like I was saying, the refractive index of air is always set at 1.00, just arbitrarily. Uh, so we are actually interested in the refractive indices of uh, all the different media that light is going to pass through as it comes through the anterior segment of the eye. So light is going to be coming into our retina, excuse me, into our eyes from the air. So that's 1.00. Uh, next, it's going to strike the cornea, which has a refractive index of 1.38. So those are two very different numbers. So the light is going to refract pretty uh, significantly. Uh, from the cornea, we then go into the aqueous humor, which is the uh, uh, extracellular fluid that exists in between the cornea and uh, the lens. Then it's going to go into the vitreous humor uh, from the lens. So the lens is 1.40, then the vitreous humor, which separates the lens from the uh, retina. So every time we go from one medium to another, from the air to the cornea, from the cornea to the aqueous humor, from the aqueous humor to the lens, from the lens to the vitreous humor, every time we go from one medium to another, the light is going to, bending, to be bending back and forth. So your greatest degree of refraction is going to occur between the two media that have the biggest difference in their refractive indices, which is going to be air, and the cornea, a difference of 0 0.38. So that will be where you get the greatest amount of refraction. Uh, so in this picture, you can kind of see a very simplistic view of kind of how light gets refracted as it passes from medium to medium. And this is this picture that you're seeing right here uh, ignores the refraction happening from the uh, from the uh, aqueous humor right here and then the vitreous humor right here. It's just showing you the refraction that happens off of the cornea and the lens, which is okay. Uh, but you can see light that is coming in at uh, kind of an incident angle here, refracts off of the cornea, refracts again off of the lens, refracts again as it passes into the vitreous humor. So the idea here is that light is going to get bent a certain number of times depending on how many... Uh, media it passes through what we are trying to do here is we want all of the rays of light that are coming in through the anterior segment of the eye we want all of those rays of light to strike the retina in phase with each other which is something that we'll address here in just a little bit uh, but based on uh, the number of media that we have light passing through so cornea aqueous humor lens Vit, uh, the, the lens we can actually count twice because it, uh, it happens twice and then the vitreous humor because uh, we are uh, refracting the light uh, a certain number of times four times if you count the vitreous humor just once every time the light gets refracted you flip your image upside down so because we're doing that an even number of times 
uh, the image that actually strikes the retina here is going to be inverted and flipped around. So part of what the occipital lobe is going to do once that information makes it back from the thalamus uh, into the back of the brain is the occipital lobe actually has to correct and reflip that image the way that it's supposed to go. So uh, we definitely don't want to... Uh, uh, underestimate how important that processing is. Okay, so like I was saying, one of the most important things that has to happen in the refraction of light is that once all that refraction is done, we want all of those rays of light to converge on a single point, which is what we're going to call the focal point of the light. And we want that focal point to be right on top of those sensory photoreceptor cells in the back of the retina. So one thing that can uh, challenge us in this regard, you can imagine if you're just looking at a stationary object, uh, like if I have uh, my TV remote here, if I'm just looking at my TV remote and it's not moving and I'm not moving, I should be able to keep it in focus pretty much. But if this object starts moving around, then the focal point of the light reflecting off of this remote is going to be changing for me. So part of what I need to do in order for this remote to not look blurry as it's moving back and forth is my eyes are going to use a mechanism called accommodation to adjust the curvature of my lens to make sure that even though the object is moving, the focal point does not change. So uh, accommodation, this use of the ciliary, excuse me, uh, the use of these ciliary muscles, this smooth muscle that is actually attached uh, to the structure of the lens here, uh, the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body actually will contract and relax in real time and basically mold the lens so that we can adjust its curvature to make sure that that focal point always stays the same. So your takeaway from this is, should be that the lens is not just a static stationary object, it is very dynamic. It molds itself and changes in real time so that if we're looking at something that is moving around, then we can still see it crisply and clearly. But as you can imagine, there is a limit to this if something is zooming around at a speed that is much faster than our lens's ability to adjust to that, that object is going to look a little bit blurry as it moves by. So uh, a race car zip zipping by or something else, if it's moving really, really fast, it's going to look blurry to you as it moves by just because your lens is good at accommodating, but there's a limit to how good it can be. Okay, so visual acuity. So uh, if you've ever gone to the optometrist, which I'm sure everyone has, uh, when you do the eye chart, when you have like the big letter E at the top and then the letters get smaller and smaller, the further down you get, uh, what you are being tested for is your visual acuity. Basically your ability to see objects in a crisp and clear manner and to make out what they are. So what affects your visual acuity? What determines it? is how well the structures in the anterior segment of your eye are able to refract light and focus it onto the focal point right on top of your retina. So the way this is supposed to work, which you can see right here, uh, normal vision called emetropia involves light passing through the anterior segment of your eye and then converging on the focal point which should be right on top of your retina right there. So for those of you that are blessed with 20-20 vision, that's not me by the way, for those of you that are blessed with 20-20 vision, this is what you are experiencing. Everything about the structure of your anterior segment is just perfect so that you can focus light right on top of your retina. So there are two ways, really three ways, two major ways that this can go wrong, typically in uniform fashion. The first is through myopia. So myopia is what I have. It's what I experience and it's what the vast majority of people who have to wear corrective lenses experience. So this is actually something separate from the accommodation mechanism. So with accommodation, 
physiologically speaking, we can adjust the curvature of the lens. We can actually adjust it dynamically. There is no accommodation mechanism to adjust the curvature of the cornea. So if the curvature of your cornea changes over time, that's basically going to be an irreversible change if you're not talking about something like LASIK surgery. So for someone with short-sightedness like myself, my corneas are actually far too curved. They have grown over time and gotten really, really stretched and curved, and they are refracting light too much so that when those light rays strike my anterior segment, my cornea uh, refracts them too much so that the focal point is now in front of the retina so that by the time the light actually hits the retina, those light rays are now out of focus and out of phase. So what my corrective lenses are here to do is to provide an extra medium of refraction my optometrist has done calculations on my eyes by measuring my uh, visual acuity to determine how much extra refraction and extra correction is going to be necessary in order to shift that focal point right back on top of the retina, which is where it's supposed to be, which is why if I take my glasses off, everything looks blurry to me because I don't have that extra medium to refract the light. And as soon as I put my glasses on, everything looks crisp and clear again. Uh, the other major way is called hyperopia, which is farsightedness, and it's just the opposite. The cornea is not curved enough, it is flattened out, and in this case, not enough refraction occurs, and the focal point ends up behind the retina, so that by the time the light strikes the retina, it is again out of phase and everything's going to look blurry. So you would again need corrective lenses in order to uh, make that correction and get the focal point right back on top of the retina, which is where it's supposed to be. Uh, so the other way that this can occur is with, I think I have it on the next slide, yeah. So the other way this can occur is with astigmatism. So this is not a uniform change in the cornea, so you're not dealing with either the, the whole cornea is too curved or the whole cornea is too flat. Uh, astigmatism is the result of a lack of uniformity in the cur curvature of either the cornea or the lens. In this picture here, you can see that it is the lens. So this can cause some light rays to be in focus while others are not. So this requires a little bit more complex of a type of corrective lens, but it is still fixable. Uh, so. A procedure which has uh, come into vogue in the last 20 to 30 years is LASIK. So this is visual corrective surgery. Uh, you may not have been aware, it is actually a acronym. It stands for Laser Assisted In Situ Keratin Keratinomiliosis. I always struggle, struggle with that one. So not to get into the nitty gritty details of it, but basically what it involves is if someone has a cornea that is too curved or too flat, uh, a laser is used to make a small incision into the cornea and then the surgeon can adjust manually the curvature of the cornea so that we can align the focal point with the retina the way that it's supposed to be. And then we can seal up that incision and basically lock everything into place. Okay, so at that point, that pretty much finishes up our discussion on the anterior segment of the eye covering the cornea, the lens, the aqueous and vitreous humors, their roles in refracting light and getting everything to go. Now, keep in mind, we did not discuss things like intraocular pressure, the generation of aqueous and vitreous humor, the sorts of things that determine your intraocular pressure. So, uh, if you're interested in something like uh, glaucoma, which is a disease of the anterior segment that results in increased intraocular pressure, I apologize, we don't really have time to talk about that, but uh, you may want to go ahead and uh, look into those sorts of things on your own. It's fascinating, we just don't really have time to talk about it. So just in case you were looking for that, that's kind of my explanation for why we're not really going to talk about glaucoma. Okay, so let me move this down here to get it out of the way. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to finish up by talking about the posterior segment of the eye, which is the retina for the most part. Uh, so here on the right, you can see a picture of the whole retina. And 
The first thing you should appreciate is that the retina consists of many different types of cells. So the very, very, very back of the retina, we have this layer of epithelial cells, which is called the retinal pigmented epithelia, or RPE. And they are, uh, the fancy scientific word for this is interdigitated. They are interdigitated with photoreceptor cells, which are our specialized sensory cells for us being able to detect photons of light. So by interdigitated, we basically mean uh, those RPE cells have little cilia that stick out like this, and the photoreceptor cells kind of wedge themselves in between those cilia. So by interdigitated, we just mean that the photoreceptors maintain very close contact with those RPE cells. Uh, so photoreceptor cells come in two major varieties. They are the rod and cone photoreceptor cells. Uh, you should be able to just kind of look at these and tell exactly which is which. The rod photoreceptors are called rods because, guess what, they look like rods. And the cones are cones because they look like cones. There you go. Uh, we'll get into the differences between rods and cones. We're going to see that each is kind of specialized for a different type of vision, both uh, light adapted and dark adapted. So we'll get into that good stuff here in a little bit. Uh, so the photoreceptors, which is uh, going to be the cells that absorb light and get stimulated, uh, they synapse with a type of neuronal interneuron called a bipolar cell. Uh, so if you remember back in chapter 12, we talked about uh, how to identify uh, pseudo-unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar cells. I said that we wouldn't really talk a whole lot about bipolar cells except in the retina and in the olfactory bulb. Well, we're in the retina, so here you can see these bipolar cells. They're basically just acting as interneurons, bridging the gap between your photoreceptors and your retinal ganglion cells, or RGCs. The retinal ganglion cells are particularly important because it is their axons that make up the optic nerve. So the second cranial nerve, that optic nerve that exits out the back of the eye, that whole bundle of axons is coming from these retinal ganglion cells. So there are their cell bodies in the retina. Their axons penetrate out the back of the eye through the optic disc and go into the brain, into the optic tract, through the optic chiasm. They are carrying the information about our vision. So that is worth remembering there. Okay, so... The photoreceptors have two major parts to them. The part we want to focus on, let me move this in a less onerous way. Uh, the part we want to focus on is this part right here, which is called the outer segment. This would be called the inner segment. The inner segment is basically kind of like the cell body. It's where the nucleus, the mitochondria, and all the organelles are. So the outer segments are basically just big stacks of disks like this. If you remember your general biology on something like photosynthesis, this is going to look like those thylakoids that chloroplasts have. They stack them on top of each other. That was where all the chlorophyll was for photosynthesis. So this is kind of a similar deal here. So we have these stacks of membranes in the outer disks here. Uh, so this is going to be where you find a special pigment protein mixture called rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is the special type of protein pigment molecule that has the ability to absorb light and produce physiological responses for us. Let me move this down here. So rhodopsin uh, is a complex of a G protein coupled receptor in those membranes called opsin and it becomes rhodopsin when it complexes with a vitamin A derivative called retinal. So retinal has the capability, it is what we call a chromogenic molecule, it has the ability to absorb and become excited by electromagnetic radiation. In this sense, we're talking about visible light. So anything between 400 and 700, 750 nanometers of light. So retinal can absorb that visible light, and what that is going to lead to is the uh, photoisomerization, basically kind of shifting around of chemical components of the retinal called the visual cycle. So when 
Retinal absorbs a photon of light. It shifts its bonds around, and then we treat a lot of different things here. We have to reset things so that we can do this process again and again and again. You don't need to worry about that. The RPE plays a role in that. It's a little bit complicated, so like I said, don't worry too much about it. But basically, this is going to activate the G-protein coupled receptor in such a way that the photoreceptor itself becomes depolarized and gets excited and is going to send messages down to the bipolar cells, then to the retinal ganglion cells, and that will be how we get information going through the optic nerve there. Uh, this, there we go. So this will lead to action potentials coursing through the optic nerve as we've discussed before. Uh, so one thing I will caution you on, uh, if you do kind of your own further reading on this, uh, the way that information goes from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells to the RGCs is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, basically, to kind of sum it up the best I can, uh, when the photoreceptors are not stimulated with anything, so if you're in a pitch dark room, they are actually constantly releasing inhibitory neurotransmitter on the bipolar cells. So when the photoreceptor becomes stimulated with light, they don't actually release excitatory neurotransmitter. They actually just stop releasing the inhibitory ones, and that causes the bipolar cells to get excited. It's, it's weird how it works. Like I said, it's counterintuitive, so don't worry too much about that. If you can just focus on uh, the role that rhodopsin plays in absorbing light, activating the photoreceptor, and then that leads to action potentials through the optic nerve, that should be good enough for us. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the difference between rods and cones. So if you will recall, back when we talked about imaging techniques in chapter one, which we talked about things like x-rays, uh, NMR or uh, MRI, uh, ultrasound, and things of that nature, uh, we spent some time talking about vi the visible light spectrum, which as I just mentioned, it goes from uh, about 400 nanometers to we cap it off at about 700. I said 750 earlier, I meant 700. So the reason why we can sense light that falls into this very narrow spectrum is because our rod and cone photoreceptors will be activated by those specific wavelengths. We cannot see infrared radiation, which is anything beyond 700. We cannot see UV radiation, anything beyond 400, because our photoreceptors cannot be activated by those wavelengths. So our rod photoreceptors are very, very, very sensitive. They are going to be responsible for your scotopic or dim light vision. So when you're in a very dim or dark room, anything that you're able to see, you attribute to your rods. They are very sensitive. You have lots and lots and lots of rods in your retina. So that accounts for your ability to basically see in the dark. Not only are the rods very sensitive, they greatly, greatly, greatly outnumber uh, the cone photoreceptors all over the retina, except a very particular place that we'll talk about later, which is called the macula. Uh, so cones are a lot less sensitive than rods, but they are going to be responsible for producing our color vision. So our ability to make things out in different colors we owe to our cones, and they are responsible for our photopic vision, so our ability to make out details and contrasts and colors when there is plenty of light around. So if you've ever been in a dim or dark room, you're going to have a really hard time seeing colors just because your cones are not real sensitive to that very uh, low level of light, so you're not going to see colors real well in the dark, but anything that you can make out in the dark is going to be because of the rods anyway. So our ability to make out different colors, like the blues, the greens, the reds, etc., we actually have different types of cone opsin proteins that are each able to absorb light in different wavelength ranges. So these cones are called the blue cones, the green cones, and the red cones. So as you can imagine, the blue cones will detect your blue colors, so your purples, your blues, and kind of your light greens. 
The green cones have some overlap there to get the light greens, the greens, and the yellows, and then the red cones take care of everything else. So you can notice these three different graphs here, there's a significant amount of overlap there so that with all three of those types of cones working together, we get complete coverage over the entire light spectrum. So what do you think would be the result if someone, say, had some sort of genetic problem with one of these cone opsin proteins? Say they have some sort of defect that keeps your blue cone opsin from working the way it's supposed to. I'm sure you all know the answer. You would end up with someone with color blindness, which is a genetic trait usually located on the X chromosome, which is why kind of overwhelmingly it tends to be men that are colorblind more so than women because we as men only have one X chromosome. It's a recessive trait usually. So women, if they happen to carry one of those traits, they've got the other X chromosome to uh, dilute that down. Okay, so the optic disc, as we were saying before when we were talking about retinal ganglion cells, this is the place in the back of the retina where all of those retinal ganglion cells' axons converge on each other and exit out the back to make up the optic nerve so that we can get that information to the brain. So at the optic disc, which you can see right here, and then on this fundoscope image, which you can see right here, there actually are no photoreceptors located there, which is why you may be aware of this. Uh, you've got a blind spot in each eye. So each eye has an optic disc and there are no photoreceptors there. So if you have light striking your blind spot, you're not going to be make out you're go not going to be able to make out any visual information there. But you might be asking, well, I'm I've got both of my eyes open right now. I don't see any blind spots. I get pretty good coverage. Well, that's because you're using your binocular vision. You have both eyes open. They are able to accommodate for each other, cover for each other. So whatever your blind spot is in your right eye, that is made up for by what you can see with your left eye. So another region we want to highlight here is this region right here, this kind of dark region right here and right here. So this is called the macula. We said that rod photoreceptors are going to outnumber cone photoreceptors about 99 to 1 everywhere in the retina except right here. So here in the macula, you are actually going to have a predominance of cone photoreceptors. So these cone photoreceptors congregate right here because this macula region is going to be responsible for your central vision. So if you're looking straight ahead, your sharpest and clearest vision is going to be that in the center of your field of vision. Your peripheral vision is not going to be quite as sharp because those are rod photoreceptors that are making up your peripheral vision, which is everywhere outside the macular region. So because cone photoreceptors are accounting for our photopic vision, we want those to be what are responsible for our central vision. But this can be a problem in a disease that you may or may not have heard of before called age-related macular degeneration. So AMD results in over time, hence the uh, phrase age-related, over time those cone photoreceptors in the macula start to die off. So if you've got someone that is experiencing advanced age-related macular degeneration, their central vision starts to deteriorate because those cones have died off. And if you don't if you don't have any photoreceptors in the macula, you're not going to be able to see anything there. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background on this, I actually studied AMD in grad school. Uh, it is thought to be caused by the accumulation of oxidized li lipids in the retina called lipofuscin. This yellow material that you see here is called drusen, and it is basically just a big accumulation of lipofuscin uh, in the back of the retina, so you can kind of see it all over the place. So that lipofuscin is very, very toxic to the cells of the retina, namely the photoreceptors and the RPE cells. So over time, as this lipofuscin starts to accumulate, uh, the cells of the retina are going to start dying, especially the photoreceptor cells, and if there are no photoreceptors cells there after they've died off, 
guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to be able to see anything. You're not going to be tr able to transmit information through the optic nerve. So that's how you would get a situation like this. If you've got no photoreceptors there, you're not going to be able to see anything there. So if you go to the optometrist, a lot of what they do when they dilate your eye and look at your retina, they're looking for the telltale signs of age-related macular degeneration. So they're looking for the accumulation of drusen in the back of your eye. Okay, so that pretty much does it for uh, vision at this point. So now to finish off chapter 14, we just need to kind of clean up some stuff uh, that we have not quite covered yet. So we have talked about touch before. We've said a few general things, but just to kind of make sure we finish this off the right way. Uh, somatosensory modalities, so touch, temperature, position, and pain, uh, as we said, are always going to be coming in through spinal nerves in most cases. So if you stub your toe, if someone tickles the bottom of your foot, or if you take a blow to your knee or something like that, all that information is going to come in through spinal nerves. So you go in through the dorsal root, take an ascending tract up to the medulla, you'll probably cross over to the contralateral side, uh, you'll stop off at the thalamus, and then you'll project that uh, somatosensory information to the parietal lobe in the somatosensory cortex. And then whatever your appropriate efferent uh, response is, it will take the opposite way back down, just skipping over the thalamus. So for vision stuff and hearing stuff and all that other stuff, uh, we said that those types of special senses are usually going to go through cranial nerves. So that's worth remembering there. Uh, so I think we've talked about these types of uh, touch receptors before, but just in case we haven't, we mentioned that some types of sensory receptors are sometimes encapsulated within kind of a sheath of connective tissue. So I don't expect you to remember all these different types of specialized nerve endings like the Ruffini, the Meisner's, and the Pacinian corpuscles. Basically, all this is here to show you is that uh, if you're talking about your skin, which is where we sense a lot of our somatosensory stuff like temperature and things of that nature, we have different types of special sensory receptors to account for very subtle differences in different types of touch. Like vibration feels different than kind of a sharp poking. Uh, temperature changes feel different than certain other things. So lots of different sensory receptors here that help us to detect different types of changes, whether it's brushing, texture changes, poking, vibration, different things like that. Uh, so the last thing that we're going to cover here, which will give us a kind of a nice little segue into chapter 15 on the autonomic nervous system, which is mostly going to focus on efferent responses rather than all of the afferent stuff that we've covered in this chapter. Uh, so since this whole chapter has been about the somatic nervous system, the only real efferent signals that will be transmitted consciously and voluntarily for us are going to be those that stimulate skeletal muscle. Anything else that doesn't stimulate skeletal muscle will go through the autonomic nervous system. So you recall that for uh, somatic motor pathways, this information starts in the cerebral cortex in the motor cortex of the frontal lobe. We will go down descending tracks through the spinal cord. We'll probably decussate that signal over to the contralateral side at the medulla. And then wherever that information is meant to exit out through the spinal cord, whether it's at the sacral level, the thoracic level, the lumbar level, wherever it's supposed to go, that information will come out through the ventral root of the appropriate spinal nerve. So the type of neuron, as we've said many times before, that sends efferent information is called a motor neuron. Sensory neurons, you will recall, deal with afferent information. So in getting information from the brain or from the spinal cord out to whatever our effector is meant to be, we need a type of motor neuron. So if you're dealing with a somatic or voluntary slash conscious response, you're going to use a somatic motor neuron. Somatic motor neurons are very nice, very simple, because they always have the same target. Somatic motor neurons will only contact skeletal muscle, and that's it. Somatic motor neurons always innervate skeletal muscle, release neurotransmitter on it, activate it, 
We'll cover all that good stuff regarding what the muscle does after that in chapter 10. So somatic motor neurons contact skeletal muscle and will direct both reflex and voluntary control of skeletal muscle. That is opposed to autonomic motor neurons, which are a little bit different, and we'll cover those in great detail in chapter 15 here next. So autonomic motor neurons are going to innervate basically anything that is not skeletal muscle. So smooth muscle like those you find in blood vessels, uh, the bladder, other places like that, cardiac muscle obviously in the heart, glandular tissue like that you find in the mouth or in the adrenal medulla, anything that is not skeletal muscle that is under nervous system control is going to be under the control of autonomic motor neurons. So a somatic motor neuron looks about as simple and as familiar as it can to us. So this is a somatic motor neuron up here. A somatic motor neuron, what we call a lower somatic motor neuron, which will directly contact the skeletal muscle, it will have its cell body here in the gray matter of the ventral horn of the spinal cord. It projects its axon out through the ventral root, just like all efferent signals do. And this axon goes directly to our effector, which is going to be skeletal muscle. We use just the one motor neuron here. As we are going to find out in chapter 15 on the autonomic uh, nervous system, that's going to be a little bit funky and a little bit different. Usually we're going to use motor neurons that come in sets of two, what's called a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. So for a more complete discussion on autonomic motor neurons, you'll have to look forward to chapter 15. We'll discuss that in great detail there. All right, so that does it for kind of completing our discussion on chapter 14. Uh, hit me up with questions via email or video chat, however you want to do it, uh, as we've laid out in the new syllabus, adnum, or other communication that I've put out to you. If you have questions, let me know about it. Hopefully you found uh, this discussion helpful. If you have ideas for little review videos that you'd like to see me make, hit me up with those too. I'd be happy to work on that. Uh, so for the time being, I will sign off and I will see you next time with chapter 15.